Hi, I'm Tracy Tokahama Espinosa, and this is a video on APA formatting in word styles. We're just going to do three things. We're going to look at just the background. What is APA? Just sort of define it so we all know what we're talking about. And then we're going to look at a word template that's been created using APA, so we save you a bit of work there. And the third thing is we want to show you how to modify or manipulate that particular template. So in the future, if you need to change styles, uh, it's something quick and easy and it doesn't take a long time. So where does APA come from? Uh, it's in its sixth edition now. It's been around since 1974. Hopefully it'll last a lot longer. But it comes from the American Psychological Association. And they're known for a lot of things. But the, the main thing that they've done is they've contributed uh, a specific style or formatting structure on how to do research and also how to present academic papers. So why do we use APA? We use this because, you know, it's a shared language. There's hundreds of journals that use the APA format and it also gives us a common point of communication between psychology, education, and other sciences. So this gives us a way that we can share information and also allows readers to find information very quickly because we do share the same kind of formatting. So I'd say the two biggest contributions from APA that we want to look at. The first has to do with sort of defining, you know, what does academic writing look like? And there are other styles that are around, you know, MLA, Chicago, Harvard, and these really determine, you know, how you reference things, how you cite things, how you format uh, the overall look of your paper, a specific type of audience. The second big contribution is that APA helps us structure basic research design. So, the way an APA paper is generally laid out has a lot to do with the way that they expect research is conducted within the field. So what does this actually look like? Page numbers, margins, and the fact that it's double-spaced and indented. There's no extra line after each paragraph. It's just that it's indented, and this is how we know that there's a change of paragraphs. There's a one-inch margin on the left, right, top, and bottom. And the page number is always in the top right, okay? So try to remember those things. And if we think about page formatting, we think about numbers. And APA is kind of strange in their numbers. Um, you write numbers 1 through 9, you write them in words. <laughs> and then from 10 on, you write them in, in digits, OK? So numbers 10 and above are, are written in digit form. You can use Arabic numerals. When you're talking about a specific measurement, for example, four centimeters or something like that, or when the numbers represent time and dates and ages and, and scores on a scale, those things are written out in numbers. However, remember, if you're talking about approximations like about three months ago, that is written out in words. Another funny thing about numbers in APA is that starting with the 6th edition, now it's okay to have numbered lists and you can also bullet. You've never been able to bullet before in, in, in academic formatting, but you're allowed to do that in APA now. But when you have a list uh, within a paragraph text, for example, if you say there are you know six main ideas, you don't number them actually, you letter them. So you have A, B, C, D, etc. So there's no such thing as a footnote. You know, in other styles like a MLA or other styles like this, Chicago, you're, you are allowed to put footnotes. These are kind of parenthetical explanations. In APA, we do not have these. Uh, what's the thinking is that basically it's either worth including in the text or it's not. And so there's no sort of like footnote here. If you think it's important enough, do put it into the text. And if you don't, drop it. We also never underline anything in APA. Uh, there is such a thing as bold, but you never underline in APA. Aside from the page formatting, another big thing in APA has to do with headers. So then different level headers in APA. The first level header, the main header, which if you were writing a dissertation, for example, this would be your level one header. It's a chapter heading. This is centered, boldface, uppercase, and lowercase heading. So all the important words are in capital letters. A level two header is flush left. It's also the same then, boldface, lowercase headings. A uh, level three header then is indented, boldface, lowercase paragraph heading with a period. So this only has the, the very first word begins with a capital letter, but the rest of it is small, unless it's, of course, a proper name. Level four is the same as level three, but it's in italics. And level five is the same as level four, except for it's not bolded, okay? So when do we use these? We use these to divide the sections of your paper, and you should use them strategically. In a longer paper, these would be divided by big sections, like introduction, literature review, 
methodology, analysis, conclusion, those would be level one headers. But then you'd have sub-elements within each one of those. For example, you'd have a level one header could be literature review, level two level would be thematic considerations within the literature review, a description, and then level three could actually be the different topics within that literature review. When you create a table of contents, you will only be using levels one and level two. Uh, however, this is a really great way to see the general outline of your paper, is when you have these headers, you can print out a table of contents and sort of see how you've been organizing things. If it's a long paper, this is a really helpful tool. We also have headers not just for sections of papers, but also for inserts like figures and graphs. So figures and graphs are different from tables. Figures and graphs are cited underneath the figure or the graph, and it's in cursive whereas a table header goes on top and it's not in cursive. So the most appropriate way of doing this, this is the way APA suggests, is that the tables are numbered and below that you indicate the title of the table. I will accept in our course, and I actually uh, motivate you to do this, if you create the table headers on a single line, this is helpful when you create the table of contents automatically. Instead of just saying table one, two, three, four, which doesn't refer to anything, you actually have the table title embedded in the table of contents if you do that. So by creating headers, you're able to automatically create a table of contents in Word, and we'll talk about how to do that in just a second. And the third big element of APA has to do with how we reference things. Uh, an in-text reference means when you cite a source, remember we said we don't do footnotes? Well, we do include citations for paraphrasing and direct quotes. For example, if I had taken an idea from Cresswell here, right? So the author should choose the methodology based on the research question is something I'd like to attribute to Cresswell. He doesn't say those exact words, but that's what he means, right? So I parenthetically refer to him by listing his last name as well as the year of the publication. However, if I were to have a direct quote, I need to use quotation marks around the direct quote, and not only do I need to list the author's name, so this is according to Bryman, and then I put the year that he wrote it, comma, the page number, page 97. So when you have a direct quote, you need those three pieces of information. The author's last name, the year of publication, and the page number it came from. It doesn't have to be in that order. You can stylistically say, according to Byerman, parentheses, 2006, there can be little doubt, blah, 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 parentheses, page 97. You can put it in any order you like, but you have to have those three pieces of information. More and more of you are going to be using digital or electronic versions of journal articles. In the case that you have a citation from an electronic source, more times than not now, you're not going to have a page number listed within that reference. So you have to list by uh, indicating paragraph. So instead of listing the page number, you list what paragraph it came from. So another thing to call your attention to is uh, at the end of your document, you create a reference list. And these are called references in APA, not bibliography, because it's not a list of everything you've ever found. Uh, bibliography also means, you know, like books. And we know these days uh, citations can come from many different sources, not just a book, right? Uh, so in APA, in the reference list, you only list there all the things that were referred to in the real text. You don't list everything you ever read, only the things that you actually paraphrased or cited. So there's many different sources you can have, dissertations, books, chapters and books. Let's look at a couple of those things and how they look. They're all going to have something very similar. They're all listed alphabetically um, by the author's last name and by then by the year. If you happen to have an example where you have the same author or authors from the same year, then you have to follow that with an A or a B to order your references so that when you make a reference within your document and you say Pastor and Stanberg 2002, you should say A or B so we know exactly which of those references your text is referring to. So let's say we take somebody's dissertation and we want to cite it. You list the author's last name followed by the first initial. We do not put the whole name, we only put the first initial. That's followed by the year of publication, period, and then the title of the document. Now when it's a dissertation then, you also indicate that it's a dissertation and the university it came from. And in the United States, all dissertations are uh, indicated with an AAT number as well, and that follows at the very end. If you were to have books, you know, with one or more authors or chapters in books, Similar pattern, right? You have the author's last name, first initial, year of publication, and the title of the book. That is followed then by a city, state abbreviation, a colon, and then the publication house. 
Note that the title of the book is in italics here. If the book has had multiple editions, so for example, this is a sixth edition of the book, that's followed parenthetically after the title of the book, and it's not in italics. If you have multiple authors, same pattern, right? Last name, first initials, and then you have an ampersand right here. Just between the last and second to last authors, you put an ampersand here, all right? In this case, these people were editors of this book. So we've also followed their name, capital, EDS, uh, period, and that's followed by the year of publication again, title of the book in cursive, and then the city. In this case, since it's another country, it's the city and country, followed by a colon, and the name of the publication house. If you have a chapter in a book, kind of similar, but here's a, a bit of a difference here. Here we're citing the names of the people who actually wrote the chapter in the book, right? And we'd say title of the chapter, and that is not in cursive. But then we put that it was in somebody else's book. It was in Perez's book, and he edited it, and that title of the book is in cursive, okay? So the title of the chapter is not in cursive. The title of the book is in cursive. This is followed the city, and since it's a foreign country, it's a city, comma, country, a colon, and the name of the publishing house. If you have journal articles, you cite pretty much the same way for a digital journal as you would for a real, you know, physical journal. Uh, you list the authors, as we mentioned here. It's followed by the publication date. The article title, kind of like the chapter in the book, is not in cursive. That is followed, though, by something in cursive, which is the name of the journal. The important words are in capital letters, whereas in the title of a journal article, only the very first word is capitalized. Uh, the title of the journal is followed by a comma, then followed by the volume number, the issue number, another comma, and then the page numbers. So in this case, we have the, the author's last name, separated by an ampersand, followed by the year of publication, the title of the journal article, followed by the title of the journal, which is followed by the volume number, the issue number, and the page number. Identical for digital journals that you'll find online, except for sometimes you won't find page numbers listed. In this case, we did. But then you should always list the DOI. This is the Digital Object Identifier. This is a unique number given to all these peer-reviewed journals that you'll find uploaded. And if you find the article online, uh, and it has a DOI, then you list that, uh, and there's no doubt about it. You do not have to say, uh, downloaded or retrieved on a specific date, you just have to list the DOI because that will be consistent for the life of this article. So think of the article. Does the article have a DOI? If it has a DOI, that's what you list. You list the same entry as if it was a journal, just followed by the DOI. If it doesn't have a DOI, then you have to find out, figure out if you got it from a database. If you did get it from a database like, you know, ProQuest or PsychoInfo or something like that or PubMed, then you say where you got it from. You indicate the date and where you got it from, which, which of these um, databases you got it from. If it doesn't have a DOI and it doesn't have a database, then you list the URL. You say, you know, retrieved on whatever date from whichever URL. Uh, that's the least efficient way of citing because uh, URLs, uh, the links can break or web pages change, whereas the DOI, as I mentioned before, is something that is unique and will never change. Other types of citations then that you might have are websites, and when you indicate the website, you indicate the date that it was downloaded, and you indicate the precise URL that it came from. When you have newspapers, newspapers similar to the other ones, you'd list the last name, initial, date, and then the name of the newspaper article, not in italics, the name of the newspaper, yes in italics, and that's followed parenthetically by the exact date of publication. So you list the year here, but you put the exact date that it was written, and then the day that you downloaded it. If you want to list a video, that's slightly different, okay? In APA, we put in brackets the uh, subtype. So sometimes when they are conference notes or videos, uh, you'll put them in brackets uh, parenthetically, okay? So we have, you know, the author's last name, then you have the first initial, you always list the year first, followed by the month, followed by the day. You list the name then, the title of the video, and then parenthetically you put the word video, that it is a video, all right? Then you indicate uh, it was retrieved, you put the date it was retrieved, and the URL it came from. Conference proceedings can be in two formats. If they are published conference proceedings, then you follow the identical format that you might have for a chapter in a book, for example. So you have the author's last name, the date of publication, 
the name of his paper, the paper that he presented. And where did, where did it come from? It came from, and these are the people who edited the conference proceedings. This is the name of a conference. So this conference does have, like the title of a journal, the main words are in capital letters. And then parentheses, since it's a published conference proceedings, you put the page numbers in the chapter of a book, you indicate exactly which pages it is in this book. You list the city, in this case this is Queensland in Australia, and it's followed by colon in the name of the publisher. If these were unpublished conference proceedings, then what you would is very similar to this, except for you would indicate the date of the conference as opposed to the page numbers. And then you would follow that parenthetically by saying conference notes. Now all of these can be done really easily and you can get a head start on this so you don't have to memorize how to do all your references if you do use Google Scholar. And um, I want to encourage you to watch the video that we made on Google Scholar. So while it's not perfect, you know, Google Scholar can sort of help you get a leg up there and it's a bit faster than doing it all on your own. So some other important things to remember about references is that multiple references by the same author, same year. Remember we mentioned that, right? So you have to follow that up with 2002A, 2002B if you have same authors. Um, list everyone. There are no blank lines in APA. So like in MLA, you would have something where you just have this blank line here uh, when you are repeating the same name of the author. And in MLA, you list the whole author's name. You can obviously tell this is a different formatting structure. We don't do this in, in APA. In APA, starting with the sixth edition, they also are not crazy about people using et al and uh, opposite for indicating multiple authors in text. So when you write in text, you shouldn't say, you know, Jones et al. You can say Jones and colleagues or something like that, right? And using opposite, just to parenthetically make reference to the, to the same reference you just made, you can't do that anymore. It's sort of like, it's redundant, but you really do have to list every single reference over and over and over again, okay? Another thing to remember is that some articles you're going to come across have many, many authors. If they have more than six authors in the reference section, you list the first six followed by et al. You don't list all of them. Uh, in some cases, I have seen now that people start to list uh, the first six, dot, 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 and then the last one, so that you know the first and last author to make it easier to find in referencing. So that's basically how we set up a paper in APA. But what does this mean for the research design? So the main sections in a research design paper or something done in APA follows these basic sections. You have a front page, you have the introduction, literature review, the analysis, methodology, conclusions, which are immediately followed by the references, and that is followed by the appendix. The appendix are lettered A, B, C, D. If we create word styles for all of these, then all we have to do is uh, click on the button there and we'll create this automatic uh, table of contents as well with all of those same uh, structures. And that's what we're going to get to next, okay? There's a template. Uh, we decided for our class, we're, we're not going to like put you through this trauma of creating your own pages for your semester project. And we've created a word template. So this template is going to save you the hassle of thinking about, you know, what is the exact margin or where does the page number go or how do I set up the headers or all the rest of that. So please watch the semester project submission video that we made so that you can understand exactly which pieces of the template get submitted in which moment. It's pretty logical. It pretty much goes from the introduction to the literature review to your analysis and finally the conclusions. Okay, last part of this video. I want to explain a little bit about word styles. Uh, styles is something that, you know, maybe we've all seen, but we haven't really managed them before uh, on our own. I want you to know how to do this so you know how we created your template and how you can modify it later if you wanted to. So when you open up a general Word document, I'm pretty sure you guys are familiar with, you know, this toolbar here. You can see in the Top left, you'll see this, uh, you know, what typeface you're in, how big it is. I'm pretty sure most of you have used that. Many of you have also used, you know, these things about setting up and getting bullet points or numbering lists and things like that or indenting automatically or, or listing them in alphabetical order or this button, which is to do a mock-up so you can actually see how many spaces you have between words or when you have a hard return, things like that. And also you have the button here to cut and to paste and also to replicate a format. If you want one paragraph to look identical to another one, you can just use the paintbrush. You're all familiar with the bold button, the italic button, underline button, 
Uh, this is how we cross things out, right? So these are other buttons that we have here, highlight the color of the button. But some things you might not have looked at a lot have to do with styles. And the styles are right here also, right, right in front of you on the toolbar. So if you look closer to that styles toolbar, you can click on any one style and you can modify that style. So you can right click on the style and it can modify it. You could also rename the style if you want to remember, you could call this one APA instead of title one, it can be APA one or whatever you like, okay? Or you can add it to your quick style gallery, which is this particular part of the toolbar, which comes up, it's in your face all the time, okay? But once you're there and you want to modify it, the other way you can do this is you can, you can go into this little button here that says change styles. And on this little uh, arrow in the corner, if you click that, then you'll get a drop down menu of the same styles. And you'll see at the very bottom there, some way that says, uh, it's one says manage styles or create new styles or modify styles. So in this one you have here manage styles, all right? And when you manage the styles, you can either import or export styles from Word documents. What we want to talk about today is how to modify those styles. So if you were to click and you were to say, I want to modify a particular style, it'll tell you what the name of the style is. It'll tell you what the typeface is, the size it is, the color that it's in, okay? And then you have this little button on the bottom left that says format. If you click on format, you'll get format and you'll get paragraph. Those are the two things you need to, to modify your styles. When you're back out, once you've changed that and you say, okay, then you come back out to this menu again before you save things, there's a chance there where you can add it to the styles gallery and there's another button here, automatically update. This means, and I suggest you click this, they are clicked in your template right now. If you click this, then when you say, okay, the next time you want to use that style, the next time you choose heading one, or the next time you change a heading one, all of the heading ones will change, for example, okay? So the automatic update saves you a lot of time in the long run. So as I mentioned before, when you click that button, format, you know, you have this thing of font, you have paragraphs, tabs, borders, languages, numbering. You can get this drop-down menu and you can change, for example, in paragraphs, whether it is this automatic indent paragraph or not, or whether uh, it is double-spaced or not, okay? So these are the buttons you're going to use to modify a style. If you, you may find that accidentally you modify a style, like when you're typing, you type over something, and Word will ask you, they'll say, hey, are you, do you want this to be your new style, or do you want to update it, or is it just for this time? So you can say, oops, I made a mistake, reapply the old formatting, please, okay? Or uh, you can accept it, and but everything that you type from then on in that particular style will change within your entire document. Okay, so let's get to our template classroom, okay, and you get into the home page here, you'll find on the bottom, you'll find uh, resources for students. If you click that, you'll be carried to another page that gives you a hyperlink directly to the APA style guide from the official APA page. So you have quick questions, not only what is uh, APA style, the rest of it, but you have quick references. How do you list, for example, a book review, or how do, would you list a, a reference from Twitter or Facebook or something like that, or what is punctuation uh, structured like? So there's a lot of uh, helpful hints here connected straight from our Canvas page, but there you will also find the template for our class. So if you click on that, you'll see the template and it'll come up. And if you download it, then I can show you how to manipulate styles. So go ahead and download it. You have a front page here. Now we don't require that for most of your assignments. We would like it for your final paper. It's not required for when you do every individual submission, submission one, two, three, four, five, but it is required for the final submission. Uh, and then you'll have the table of contents here that indicates that this is a level one heading, a level two heading, okay? In table of contents, again, you only list first two level headings. That's what we were talking about before. If I put my cursor on top of this, for example, there's a blue box that will come up around this particular style, right? It tells me this is called APA level one, right? Remember I mentioned to you, you could also go in here, and I, and I work from a Mac, so if you have a PC, you'll find this in the bottom right-hand corner. You have this button here, you click on it, and you'll have exactly the same menu that's up here, but you'll have it down in a, in a vertical level. And again, this, uh, this particular header is circled in blue because it's telling me there's been a style created for that particular header, right? 
If I go just below that, I can also see that, ah, there's a style there. So APA body text. This means that it's got the right indentation uh, and that it's double spaced and there's no extra spaces below, right? This is also APA body text. So if you'd like to inspect the style, you can go into the format, you go into style, then you look at modify style and it'll tell you what it is. Uh, it's time to zoom Roman, it's 12 point, it's flush left, it's double spaced. And if I go into format and I go into paragraph, I can also see that it's considered first line and you only see three things there. There's just no formatting or it's first line or in Spanish it's called francesa, in English it's called uh, hanging indent. This tells you that the, this has a first line already set, which is a half of an inch, 0.5, which is normal for uh, a regular indented paragraph. Okay, so each of these has a style here. So we'll have all of our headers, headers one, two, three, four. So you have a header one here, level one, you have a level two, you have a level three header, and you can watch how those things change here, right? A level four, in this place or level five. So if this was necessary, if you needed to have five different levels, and most of you aren't going to have papers that are going to need are going to need that many subdivisions, but if you needed to, you can have up to five levels of subheaders in APA. Uh, we mentioned before when you paraphrase and you cite sources here, no difference in formatting. This is just APA body text, right? However, if you were to have a long indented quote, in an APA, a long indented quote is something that's over 40 words long, okay? So if you were to have a long indented quote within your text, APA style requires that that gets indented. So long indented quotes also have a style created for them here in this template. You'll see that a long indented quote doesn't have uh, quotation marks. It retains the original punctuation. And parenthetically, it has the list of authors here. No period after the reference. We have you know, a figure here and we have a table here just so you get the hang of how uh, tables should look or how figures should be cited uh, within the structure. And then we have the list of the references here. So they're also in your template, so they're a quick reference for you here. At the very, very end, you'll see a list of those headers that we had there before just to remind you in case you need to have a, a reference of how we divide those headers. And it's also an example of how you would list an appendix, which are done alphabetically, A, B, C, D, etc. Time savers I want to share with you. If you have the headers already created, like let's say we just lose our table of contents, okay, for example, and you guys, you freak out because you think, no, it's impossible, it's going to take forever to type that all back in. Well, the truth of the matter is once you have the headers created, all you have to do is put insert, you want to put in uh, indices and tables, then you want to do a table of contents, and you go to options and you say, I would like to have level one, and I would like to have level two, in a table of contents and you say accept and there it is again okay so by creating headers you've created the possibility of creating a table of contents automatically without the hassle of always you know updating your pages uh, also you can continue to type and the only thing you have to do then is hover on top of the table of contents do a right click and say you want to update i'll say okay do you want each of these fields to be updated um, by just the page number and if i say accept all the page numbers automatically change, so you don't have to go back and type it in one by one by one. The fun thing I want to show you has to do with ordering things. So say that you've been in Google Scholar and you've been saving all of these different references, you've been downloading and you've just been putting them to a Word document. So at the end of the day, you need to order them. And so you've got this long list of things here, right? And they're all out of order. We've got a G, we've got a P, we've got an H, B, B, P, C, D. So let's say we want to order it. We go to table, we go to order, we say that it, we want it ascending to descending, we say accept, and then the whole thing just changes. Okay, so that's our APA style word template. This is in our course room. I really hope you use it, and I hope it saves you lots of time throughout the whole semester. Thanks a lot.